Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? How was the week for you? You were all blessed because you are here today. God blessed us all to make it through the week today. Just got a couple announcements um, as you got your bulletin. The announcements for today is children's choir is at 1.30 to 2.15 today. Um, so if you have any kids that, would like, that you would like to participate in children's choir, uh, today is the day to uh, have them participate. The Q&A will be today at 2 p.m. And also, uh, the bulletin says there's Vespers tonight, but there is no Vespers tonight. No Vespers tonight. And um, one other thing is the bookmobile will be here tomorrow. It's in, the, it's in the bulletin. It will be here tomorrow between 2.15 and 3 o'clock. And you know they come and they leave on time. So if you show up at 2.59, you're going to be out of luck. So tomorrow at 2.15, the bookmobile will be here. So... All right, now it's time to meet and greet everyone. So if you are um, new to the church, please go out and uh, meet someone new. Everybody, move. Don't all sit there. That was a good meet and greet. Glad to see everybody is uh, meeting and greeting. We should do this more often instead of just on Sabbath. You should call up your brother or your sister during the week just to see how they're doing to make sure everything is good for them. So now we're going to have an opening prayer. So everybody um, silence and uh, bow your heads for opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us this week. We know without you, we would not be here today. We know that it's your grace that has um, given us an opportunity to come worship you today. And Lord, as we open up this service in dedication to you, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit down to be with us, to dwell with us, to enlighten our minds and open our hearts to, to hearing your word. And not just hearing your word, but make the words that we hear today practical in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone. All right, it's now time for children's story. So if all the children will come down to the front for children's story. Hello? Can you hear me? Hey, boys and girls. Oh, no, no. Hey, boys and girls. Did you guys have a good week? So did I. 
Today, I'm going to see if you guys can help me a little bit. This is a soccer ball. And we just finished one of the biggest competitions the world has ever seen. And it's called the World Cup. How many people know what the World Cup is? Only a few. Well, basically, what the World Cup is, it's a group of countries that get together and they play soccer. And the best country usually wins. So today, who said that? (laughs) Today, I want you guys to help me. I used to teach soccer some time back and I used to play. So what I want to do this morning, I want to just talk a little bit about what I used to do as a coach when I'm getting my team ready for a game. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to need a goalkeeper. All right. You look like a good goalkeeper. You come over here. All right. I want you to stand right here. This is your goal. And you stand right there. All right. Now, the goalkeeper is a very special person in the team. He's very important. It's his job to make sure that this ball doesn't go past him. It's his job to protect that goal. Because if the other team scores, then they get a point. But the goalkeeper on his own cannot do the job. He needs other players. So what I do, I choose four defenders. You look like a defender. You stand right there. Right there, facing this way. Yeah, you'll be a good defender. And you can stand right there. And yeah, you come over here. You can be a defender. (laughs) And you stand right there. And I think I need one more. Yeah, come on. All right. So now we've got four defenders. And your job is to protect the goalkeeper and make sure that no balls come through so that the goalkeeper has to save. We don't want him making saves. We want you to make sure you protect the goal. Now, we have a goalkeeper and we have a defender, but that's not enough. We need people in the middle of the field, and we call them midfield players. So, I want a couple of midfield players. Let me show you. You're going to stand right here in the middle, all right? I need you. Come on. You're going to stand right here on the right-hand side, and you're going to be right midfield. Who else? Who else? Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Come on. And you're going to stand right here. All right? And I need one more person. Just one more. There you go. And you're going to stand right. So now we have a goalkeeper. We have uh, four defenders, four midfield players, Your job is to protect the defenders, to make sure that the ball doesn't go back to the defenders. And the defenders, it's your job to protect the goalkeeper so that he doesn't have to make any saves. So everybody has a job to do. But the most important people are the strikers. The strikers are the guys that score the goal. So let me see. You can be a striker. You up here, and you can stand right there facing me, and we eat one more. Mum, come on. Yeah, you can come. All right, Mum, she's nice and tall. So the ball is going to come over, and she's going to be able to stand up and bang, head of the ball in. Nice and tall. So you're there. So now we have the strikers. Your job is to score goals. All right? It doesn't matter how much we defend. If you don't score goals, we cannot win. All right? So, goalkeeper, you ready? Midfield. No, defenders, ready? We have the midfield. You guys are ready. And we have our strikers. The rest of you guys are the fans. We have to have fans. We have to have people that come and support the team. If you guys don't show up, the team doesn't feel like they want to play. So it's important that you guys come to support. Now, what has this got to do with being a Christian? I'm telling you today that in our church, today, our church is like a soccer team. 
each person in this church has a role to play. We have midfield players that could be our elders. We have our deacons. We have the goalkeeper over there, which could be the pastor. All right? And then we have the rest of you guys, which are fans, could be just normal people that come every week, but they support you guys. The only way we are going to be able to work together as a team is if we support each other. And in soccer, the only way that you can win is if we work together. And the church is the same way. We have to work together as a church. And everybody has their own jobs to do. But the most important thing is the ball as a team. we got to score goals. And in the church, our job is to bring people to Jesus Christ. And to do that, we have to work together. All right. This is what I used to do. I used to get all the kids together. Come up here, guy. Come on. Everybody come together. Come, come around. Put my hand around. Put, my, put your hands on my hands. All right. There you go. All right. Nice. Now, what we're going to do, I'm going to pray. And when I finish pray, we're going to say, I'm going to say one, two, three. And we're going to give a good shout to Jesus. All right. All right. Close your eyes now. Dear God, I thank you so much for these young people. I'm asking you that you will be with them, that you will protect them and their families and help them, Father, that they will be supportive to their parents. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ready when I say after you, one, two, three, Jesus. One, two, three, Jesus. All right, take care. All right, let me put this back. Can I have my soccer ball? Thank you. All right, guys, go back to your seats. Thank you. are here because God is our God and we want to worship him and we want to magnify him. Please turn in your hymn, uh, here's our song books to page 12. I know the bulletin says another song but we don't have that one together today so we're going to sing Oh Magnify the Lord. Hymn, page number 12 and here's our song. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name, because there's power in his name, is there not? Page 229 of your hymnals, page 229 of your hymnals. Let's stand, shall we?
Thank you. You can be seated. Good morning. It's now time for us to um, give back to God a portion of what he's given to us. And so if the deacon and deaconess would stand for prayer. bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you part of what you've given to us. Lord, we, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to you and that our portion of what we give is so tiny, but we know that you can bless it and you can make it do mighty works. Dear Father, thank you for receiving these gifts and Lord, we pray that um, You'll bless this money. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's been beautiful to see answered prayer in so many of your lives um, in, the, in the recent past as well. And as we go into our prayer time as a church family, um, I invite those who would just want to pause before God's throne to come forward. Uh, we open up the altars here at the front of the church. We pray together. Um, you can turn in your hymn books to hymn 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me. And let's, um, let's prayerfully sing this hymn together as those who would like to spend some time in God's presence can do that. Thank you. Jesus, King of kings, be 
I'd like to invite the congregation to kneel as we pray together, wherever possible. Are there any unspoken requests this morning? Father in heaven, it's so moving to know that when we call on Jesus' name and we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, that we enter into your presence. And that's why we are here today, Father. We want to be in your presence. Please touch us each individually and personally. Thank you so much for each person that has come. Every member, every guest, every regular attendee. We pray for those who are traveling, who are still out on summer vacations. We pray for those who are ill and cannot be here, those who are watching online. Father, we pray for your spirit to pour down upon us. We were created to be thrilled by your infilling. And that's why, Father, we ask for more of your spirit today. Thrill us, Lord. Fill us. Give us the confidence that we need in a very uncertain world that we are safe with you And that you will lead your people victoriously to the end. You've seen the hands of those who have unspoken requests. Lord, you've seen those who have come forward to be ministered to and to just spend time at the foot of your throne. And Lord, we are trusting you that where you say, Before we ask, you already know our needs, and we are trusting you to answer those needs, but above all, to draw us closer to you and to remove anything that could separate us from you. Thank you, Father, that we can meet as a church family. Thank you that we can just come here and invite the peace of heaven to descend upon upon this place. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We're in part four of a sermon series, The Discipleship Dialogue, and um, we'd like to sing our theme song before we start with the, with the presentation this morning. Everyone remember the theme song? <laughs> it's taken right out of um, John 13, 34 and 35. Direct quote, it's one of the conditions of being a disciple. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you 
Have love one to another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. Again, a new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you have love one to another, by this shall all men know you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. Very good. Very good. Very good. Once again, thanks to our sound and media team who make it possible for these um, sermons in the series to be recorded and to be posted to YouTube. So if you don't manage to make... um, make it to one of our services, you can go to YouTube in order to, um, in order to see the presentations that have been made up until now. Um, I'd like to welcome a special guest amongst us here this morning, Pastor Bob Hayes and his wife, Melanie. Um, just wave at us, Bob. I'd have you come forward, but I'm sure you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, Pastor Bob is the one that was responsible for telling us about the free medical clinics. And uh, we went down and saw his free medical clinic down in Palm Coast, and that got us involved with the Hawaii Free Medical Clinic. And Pastor Bob and I have been working closely together. Um, We told them about Family Promise, and so Pastor Bob and them are now doing Family Promise in their church. So we hope to take a little tour back down to Palm Coast and um, see all the new things that they are doing there. But it's, it's exciting to, um, to see what God's doing in His church to make a difference in the, the local communities. My friends, this morning, my sincere and heartfelt prayer is that you will meet with Jesus Christ And that you won't see me up front here. As a matter of fact, just block me out completely um, as I pray this morning that God's word and God's word alone will, will be visible and will be heard this morning. So let's pray again. Father in heaven, here is one example of your grace. A sinful, unworthy human being breaking the bread of life to your people. And so, Father, once again we call on your blood. First of all, over my life, Lord, to cleanse me and purify me. And second of all, over your church, individually and corporately. Lord, we love you. We've experienced you. We know you are alive and well. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of faith. Forgive us for moving away from you and losing connection with you from time to time. But this morning, right now, in this very moment, I pray for that personal, private, intimate, individual connection with our Maker the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we open your word, Father, may our hearts be warmed and touched and thrilled as your spirit comes upon us, is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 
young Charles was heading off to church. It was a Sunday morning. It was a wintry morning, and when he left home, the weather was fine. It was cloudy. A chill wind was blowing. But as Charles got halfway to church, where his father, the pastor, would be preaching, a a high wind came up, and it started snowing. And it was snowing so hard that Charles couldn't see his way ahead. And so as he was walking down the the snow-filled street, he hid in a doorway waiting for this blizzard to blow by. And as he was leaning against the door, he heard the sound of music. And he realized that he was bunkering down in the entranceway of a little church. And so he opened the door, and as he looked in, he saw just a few people, just a handful, sitting in the pews, singing the last stanza of a hymn. And so Charles decided, there's a blizzard outside, I'm going to slip into this, the back pew and just wait it out. As the people start, stopped singing, a young, obviously inexperienced young man stood up and started presenting the Word of God to the congregation. Charles's dad was a pastor. His grandfather was a pastor. And at the age of 15... Charles, although he had heard about Jesus Christ dying for him, didn't understand how a person actually overcomes their weaknesses and their bad habits. He was confused. But that day, everything became clear to him. The young man was reading out of the book of Isaiah, And as he read the passage, look unto me, and I will make you holy. Charles was obviously out of place. He was nervous. He was a little frustrated that he couldn't get to the church that he was going to. And this young man just pointed him out and said, young man, I can see that you're uncomfortable. I can see that you are perplexed. And I can see that you don't have the joy of the Lord with you today. Look. Look. Look unto God. And He will make you holy. And right there and then, young Charles realized why things weren't clear to him. He realized that he'd been trying in his own strength to be a better person, to overcome his weaknesses and bad habits. And right there and then, he slipped onto his knees. And he said, God, I look to you. Take my life and make it holy. And from that day, Charles Spurgeon's life became a testimony of that very passage that he had had been uh, exposed to that day. Charles Spurgeon at the age of 15, stepped in for one of his pastor friends. Charles Spurgeon later took over that little church at the age of 15. At the age of 19, he was moved on to a 600-member church. And the gifts that Charles Spurgeon had in preaching the gospel, in explaining the mysteries of godliness to people, had far-reaching effects in Christianity. As a matter of fact, by the time that he died, he had preached to over 10 million people. The gifts of God were manifest in the life of Charles Spurgeon. He opened orphanages. He opened a college. God used him in a mighty, mighty way. 
from a young, confused, and bewildered young boy, God changed the life at that young age. And so we ask ourselves the question, how old do I have to be? How qualified do I have to be in order to, for God to use me and to do great things through me? So before we answer that question, by way of summary, we're going to look at our first session. We looked at a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes a disciple when their life as they know it ends and they begin a new life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Step one. Step two, who does Jesus choose? <laughs> well, he chooses the foolish and the frail. He chooses people like Charles Spurgeon, just a young boy. And then they succeed because they follow the example that Jesus set. An example of relying on the Father. An example of not doing things in their own strength, but looking to the Father and doing only what the Father shows them. And then in our third session, we saw that all the power and authority then, when a disciple ends their life, when they admit that they're just foolish and frail, all power and authority in heaven and earth is given to the disciples to push back the effects of sin. Remember last week? What was the goal? What was Jesus' mission statement? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Jesus' mission was to push back the effects of sin, to push back the darkness by doing the compassionate works of Christ. Remember what we said? In order to push back darkness, we don't fight the darkness. In order to push back darkness, we turn on the light. We turn on the light. And so, my friends, how then, the question comes to us, how then do you and I do the compassionate works of Christ? How are we many Christs to the world around us? And this is such an exciting lesson that we have this morning. Did Jesus have an advantage over us? Did Jesus come to this earth and have and, and, and set a divine example for us through His divine strength. Remember in the last sessions we said no. Jesus had no advantage over us. If you go to Hebrews chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 4 and you read through there, you'll see that Jesus was in all points tempted as we are and He took on the same flesh and blood that we have. So no, he did not have an advantage over us. As a matter of fact, no person has an advantage over us. The disciples didn't have an advantage over us. Charles Spurgeon didn't have an advantage over us. I don't have an advantage over you. You don't have an advantage over me. Why? Because it's God's power that does the work. <laughs> That's why. What God needs, he needs a fool. He needs someone that's frail. He needs someone that can admit that he cannot do anything by himself. It's our work, it's our job to stay connected with God. And so, the answer is, God gives gifts to you and God give, gives gifts to me. All power in heaven and earth are given to the disciples who end their lives and who start a new life with Jesus. All power in heaven and earth is given to those who admit they are fools and cannot do anything by themselves. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11, we read, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, just keep them, take one of your hands, and every time I say same Spirit, just lift a finger, okay? There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. All right, here's the first gift. For to one is given the word of wisdom, lift a finger, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, lift a finger. To another, by the same, to, uh, to another faith, by the same Spirit. 
to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now we've run out of fingers. Do you think Paul's trying to make a point? To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But the one and same Spirit works all in all things, distributing to each one individually as He works. So he repeats the Spirit seven times. So where do these gifts come from? God's Spirit. So my friends, the disciples of Jesus Christ, as you follow through from when Jesus called them up until Pentecost, you can see how Jesus discipled them, taught them how the power of God can be functional in their lives. How the power of God can be functional in their lives. You see, this passage clearly shows how God's power is transmitted to the disciples of Jesus Christ. It's through the gifts of the Spirit, and it's through the fruit of the Spirit that God gives these to us to battle in the spiritual realm. There's a beautiful quote. The promise of the Spirit is not appreciated as it should be. Its fulfillment is not realized as it might be. It is the absence of the Spirit that makes the gospel ministry so powerless. Learning, talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed. But without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched and no sinner will be won to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, the gifts of the Spirit are theirs. I love this. If you can see it from where you're reading, read this with me. The poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them the channel of the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. How many of you feel today that you've been living a powerless Christianity? How many of you see something in the New Testament, but yet you don't see it in your own life? How many of you see something in the New Testament, but you don't see it in the church? Remember, we asked this question last week as well. My friends, by faith, we accept the fact that if we start a new life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all power in heaven and on earth is given to us. We believe that if we end our lives as worldlings and we start a new life with Christ, all power in heaven and earth are given to us and the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit are given to us. Will we accept that gift? You see, in order for us to understand the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, we need to look at Jesus' life. Because I believe that Jesus was the model disciple. If Jesus came and He used His supernatural divine powers... Could he truly be an example to us? No, he couldn't. Because he would have a great advantage over us. So Jesus came as the model disciple. And I believe that it was the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit that empowered Christ to live the life that he led. And therefore, if we look at Jesus' life, how he led it, we will know how we should lead our lives, right? So... Jesus made it very, very clear. And those that are in the 12-step class, this is such a beautiful starting point. The first thing you do in the 12-step class is that you, re you admit that you are powerless and that you can do nothing by yourself. You admit that you are not God and that you are a slave to your habit and your weaknesses and this is what Jesus said as well. In John 5, 19, 
Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does likewise. In John 5 verse 30, Jesus repeats, he says, I myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He says again in John 8, 28, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. So Jesus does, does no action by Himself, and He speaks no word by Himself. Remember last week we said, what was the best witnessing tool that we could have? It's a piece of duct tape over our mouth. Until the Holy Spirit says, speak, we don't speak. And this is what Jesus says, I don't speak unless the Father tells me to speak. I don't speak unless the Father tells me to speak. So the best tool for discipleship is saying, I can do nothing by myself. The pastor can do nothing by himself. The president of the general conference should be able to do nothing by himself. The elders should do nothing by themselves. The deacons, anyone in the church, you can do nothing by yourself. You can only do what you see Christ doing. Because Christ did nothing unless you saw the Father doing it. So Jesus was the, the, the model disciple for each one of us. Very often... When Christians study Jesus' ministry, they conclude that he exercised his divine power. But actually, it was the fruits and the gifts of God's Spirit working perfectly to deliver supernatural results. So now what I want us to do, remember we, li we read the, the list of gifts earlier? What I want us to do is to take that same list and see how it applied into the life of Jesus Christ. Here are examples of how the gifts of the Spirit worked in Jesus. Number one, the first gift we saw was the word of wisdom. And so in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 18, Jesus gives a word of wisdom to people that are, are facing conflict. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you two or more, that by, and then Jesus quotes out of the Old, Old Testament, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him to you be like a heathen or a tax collector. Do you think that was a word of wisdom? That was a word of wisdom a gift of the Spirit that came to Jesus. The word of knowledge. In Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, have you ever read the Scriptures? Now, he hasn't got the Bible with him. He's quoting. <laughs> so here, the gift of the Spirit enables Christ to quote Scripture. And he says, have you never read in the Scriptures the stone with which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and and it is marvelous in our eyes. Was that a word of knowledge? Yes. He knew the Scriptures, and the Spirit enabled him to have them. Here's the gift of faith. In John 2, verse 6 to 8, Now there were six water, water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, contained 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Okay? He didn't say a prayer. He said to them, By faith, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said, draw out some now and take it to the master of feast. So that morning, Christ had gotten up. He had spent time with the Father. The Father had shown him what the events of that day would look like. The Spirit was with him. The Spirit was in him. And in that moment, the Spirit revealed to him by faith that he should perform that first miracle. Gifts of healings. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out of him 
and he healed them all. And he healed them all. The workings of miracles. I love this story, don't you? In Matthew chapter 17, verse 27, it says, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, and this was when they came and asked Jesus for taxes, do you remember? They asked Jesus and Peter for temple tax, and so Jesus said to um, Peter, he says, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. That was just working of a a random miracle. Prophecy, Luke 9, 22. Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. Did that prophecy come true? So Jesus had the gift of prophecy. The discerning of spirits. John 6, 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, that, he said to them, does this offend you? So Jesus discerned a complaining spirit amongst the disciples. We have no record that Jesus had the gift of discerning of tongues. We had no gift that he had the gift of interpretation of tongues. We don't have any evidence about that. Today, God brings the same gifts that He gave to Jesus Christ and that He gave to the disciples to you. To you. So my friends, how do we transition from being dormant, powerless Christians to being powerful, spirit-filled disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that? It's amazing how we as a church and, and we as Christians, we hear how Jesus surrendered to His Father. We hear that Jesus spent nights in prayer. We hear that Jesus woke got up early in the morning before the sun arose and he spent long sessions in prayer before his father. We, we know about it, but how, when last did we do that? When last did we spend an hour in prayer with God, seeking his face? We haven't, have we? <laughs> and so we ask ourselves, Is there a correlation between the power that Christ experienced and his time with the Father and his emptying himself before the Father, hungering and thirsting to be filled by the Father and the power of the Spirit that worked in Christ's life? And we write it off when we say, no, 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 Christ had an advantage over us. That's why we, the disciples had an advantage over us. But yet, we see the, the dichotomy. We see this paradox, this, this division, this split between no power and power. And yet we see how Christ got the power and how he lived out the power. And yet we want the power, but we don't really connect with it. And... I'm with you in that camp. I'm with you in that camp. Will we finally let go and accept what God provides for us? You see, my friends, we can study prophecy. We can have all the knowledge about the complicated doctrines. We can speak and teach eloquently, but still not follow the example that Christ modeled for us on how to be a disciple. And that's why the Bible says, They will come knocking at the door and say to you, Lord, 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 let us in. And what will he say? I never knew you. (laughs) But Lord, we prophesied in your name. I never knew you. Lord, we drove out demons in your name. I never knew you. Lord, we did mighty miracles in your name. I never knew you. That connection. 
My friends, it's so obvious in the Gospels that Jesus refused to do anything by himself. He only connected with the Father and did the Father's will. God's Word keeps reminding us that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the dark places. But yet, my friends, we seem to be constantly fighting flesh and blood. We, we seem to be staying in the physical world. And I think this is where Jesus realized from just a very young child, he realized that there's a, a spiritual war and there's a physical war. There's a spiritual realm and there's a physical realm. And so everything to Jesus was spiritual. And that's why he couldn't go into his day and, unless he was spiritually fortified and spiritually immunized and inoculated. So let's look at this scripture quickly. Ephesians 6 verse 12. Read it with me. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but yet if someone offends us in the church, we take it out on them. We hold a grudge against them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So what was behind that situation? Maybe there was a spiritual power. Maybe there was a, a, a trap that the enemy set, something unseen, something unknown, that caused that, that conflict or that misunderstanding. So we fight not against flesh and blood. Let's, look, let's pray for the, the discernment of the Holy Spirit to be able to see beyond that little, little skirmish or that little misunderstanding or that little... Apparent offense. We can't fight against flesh and blood. Here's another beautiful scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. My friends, when we were created, we were created as spiritual beings. We had a connection with God's Spirit. His Spirit was in us. We could see spiritually. When we fell into sin, we lost that and we became natural beings. We became natural men and women. And that's why unless we intentionally come before God and disconnect this naturalness or this flesh. We cannot understand the things of God. We cannot experience the power of God. It's almost like it's almost like we're fighting an, a very unbalanced battle. You see, we can't comp accomplish anything with regard to the expansion of God's kingdom or pushing back the effects of sin as Jesus did, unless we are working with a spiritual gift. We can't convince anyone about changing their beliefs or their lifestyles. We can't access God's healing power. We can't break demonic strongholds. We can't have the true compassion of, of Christ. And we can't have God's genuine, unconditional love. It's impossible. It's almost like Christians is this little, this little mouse here with a knife behind his back. And it's like the enemy's got a gun behind his back. And that's how we do battle. You know, we belong to the church. We're a church member. We've got our Bibles. And we're up against the enemy. And we're going to battle. And we're going to overcome this, this, all this this dysfunction in our lives, we're going to overcome our bad habits, we're going to stand against the enemy, we're going to fight against him. But he's got a gun. So unless 
we lay down our weapons and we, we admit that we are up against an enemy that's going to overwhelm us, and we take on the armor of God and the power of God, we're going to lose every battle. And so the gifts of the Spirit are spiritual gifts for spiritual warfare, pushing back spiritual darkness and the spiritual effects that the enemy tries to call us. The Beatitudes, I believe, is such a beautiful passage to show the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, the Beatitudes were for the disciples. (laughs) The people happened to gather around afterwards, but Jesus came and He taught them the Beatitudes. So how do the Beatitudes teach us to drop our little knives and to, to stand behind God's cannon so that when... The enemy of our cells pulls out his little 9 millimeter Glock. We load that cannon and we just get it ready to fire. Look how beautiful this is. And I see these, these Beatitudes almost fit in with um, the message to the Laodicean church. Except this is more positive. The Laodicean church is kind of more in your face. It says, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. This is from the, 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 good news, um, the Good News Bible. It says, Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn and have sorrow for their sin. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble. Like the, the tax collector that came into the church. Oh God, forgive me. For I'm a sinner. Bows his head. He doesn't even raise his head. And the Pharisee comes and walks in and, Thank you, God, that I'm not like him. Happy are these people who realize that they are poor, hungry, naked, and blind. Now, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Here is the Here's the crossover from someone who's convicted, who knows they need Christ. They now come before Him hungry and thirsting, wanting to be filled. And look at the result. Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, for God will call them His children. You see? The precursor of realizing your need, being filled, and then the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. Here it is. You see, the external work of the Holy Spirit convicts us that we are spiritually poor. The external work of the Holy Spirit brings sorrow for sin. The external work of the Holy Spirit humbles us, and we just realize, I'm not even looking at anyone else. Oh, God, I'm such a sinner, God. It then motivates me to fall on my knees before Him and say, God, I can't even get off. I can't even leave my house until you until you fill me, Lord, and until you break this this stubborn heart of mine. And when I hunger and thirst, the Word promises that I will be filled. And look what happens: the internal work of the Holy Spirit can take place. He fills me. I become merciful. I become pure in my heart. I'm a peacemaker, reconciling, bringing unity to God's church. The fruit of the Spirit comes out in my life. But unless this takes place, like it did in the heart of the publican, this cannot take place. Every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ first needs to be broken to where he realizes I can do nothing by myself. How do we know if we are working in the flesh and not working in the spirit, my friends? How do you know? Well, it's very easy. How do you know that you're getting sick? (laughs) Well, your nose runs, right? (laughs) Your eyes are all puffy. 
you cough, those are all symptoms that you have a virus. Well, if you took the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and you looked at them, and you took them as a measure of your life, and you played them backwards, where it says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Look at the symptoms if those are in place or those are not in place. If they're not in place, where do we go back to? If they're not in place, where do we get back to? You see, here is the fruit. If there's something missing, I need to come back to the hungering and the thirsting. And I need to come back to admitting that I'm powerless and I can do nothing by myself. And so in the quietness of your inner room, God wants to speak to you privately and personally. Have you ever done what David did? Have you ever put a mat down on the floor and just laid there and refused to get up until you feel God's touch on your life? Until you feel peace? Until you feel the, the, the disconnect from the flesh? Until you feel free to go and reconcile with your brother. Until you feel free to love unconditionally. Until you feel free to love without expecting anything in return. When that feeling comes through you, you then get up and go into your day. You then get up and go into your day. I'm going to read this quote one more time in closing. The promise of the Spirit is not appreciated as it should be. Its fulfillment is not realized as it might be. It is the absence of the Spirit that makes the gospel ministry so powerless. Learning, talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed. But without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched or no sinner will be one to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of His disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them the channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. My friends, what are your symptoms today? What are my symptoms today? Do you and I need to surrender to the external work of the Holy Spirit so that He might begin His internal work in us? I invite you to do that today, right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, teach us how to start new lives with you, leaving the old behind. Teach us, Lord, to empty ourselves completely, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to realize our condition, and to have you fill us and work in us and through us, through the gifts of your Spirit. Today, I've prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. And if God's Spirit has convicted you that perhaps you've been fighting with a sword, instead of putting the sword down and fighting with the armor of God, if you have remained in the flesh amidst your symptoms, and today you truly want to leave that life behind and wait on God and hunger and thirst for God to fill you completely. Just raise up your hand and say, God, 
I'm leaving everything behind. I want you to carry me forward from here. Just raise up your hand. God sees the hands. He sees the hearts. Father in heaven, teach us how to start a day like Jesus started a day. Teach us how to wait on you until we are full, until all self has been broken and crushed and, and left behind so that only you live in us, act in us, and speak through us. Is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's keep a prayerful, meditative atmosphere in the church.